Hello everyone and welcome to Hiring Demystified. My name is Mar. You can find me online by those handles and as you can see, I know my way around Pythons. But aside from real snakes, I've been working as a software engineer for more than a decade now, mostly doing web development for startups in Malaga and London. During my career, I've experienced dozens of interviews as a candidate and then in the later years I switched sides and became an interviewer. Today, I'm here to tell you all I've learned after tons of trial and error. Let's accept the fact. There is something off with hiring in our field. In no other profession, you see so many memes, so many jokes, and even books that help you prepare for enduring coding interviews. There's a certain mystique about hiring developers, a set of rituals that we all know and accept. Whiteboarding, algorithms, take on projects, quiz questions, crazy job specs, but is there a reason behind all these practices, or like religion, we all just follow without questioning them? If you ask people about the reasons, the answer everyone always gives is, we want to hire the best, and for that, we need to test. Every company I've ever interviewed with always prided on hiring the best developers. But can you see the contradiction? It's a physical impossibility that every single company is hiring the best people. The best people, in fact, are unlikely to ever be on the market. Somebody from their network is likely to offer them a gig when they need a job. And if a top developer happens to go job hunting, can they fund you? Can you pay their rates? Will they bother with a tiresome and lengthy process of interviews? Even if we assume you could get the best developers, unless you're a globally remote company, you're only going to be getting the best developers from your area alone, and assuming they speak your same language. Relocation packages are less and less convincing in a world where most companies are turning remote. So in essence, sorry to break it to you, but no, you're not hiring the best people in the world. At most, you can attempt to filter the best from those that reach your pipeline. But okay, let's say that you still want to test those that reach your pipeline to identify the best. The question is, what are you selecting for with your testing? You want the people who are going to be the best at providing value for your team and your company. In a job, you want people to write good code, yes, but that's just a small part of what working as an engineer is about. There's a lot about adapting, understanding, team working, a lot of soft skills that are very difficult to evaluate during a formal test. The way our interviews are designed, however, you're not even optimizing to identify the best coding ability. The people who are best at interviews are those who are confident, good at selling themselves, or that did a lot of interview practice or studying. The reason interviewing kind of works is because there's an overlap. Often, people who are good at interviews are smart, and smart people are often good developers too. But you're also missing on tons of candidates who would be perfect for you, but you're not testing for the right traits. While at the same time, you're still going to be getting some false positives. People who are good at interviews, but not so great ones at the job. All of this while losing a great deal of time and energy, both from your team members and from candidates. The question comes then, if our hiring is so inefficient, why did we even start doing it in the first place? Okay, I believe, like many other trends in the industry, we are just copying the practices of our gods, the big giants of Silicon Valley. But of course, the situation for them is very different than it is for the rest of the companies. They have certain characteristics that might make this type of hiring appropriate for them, but that doesn't mean that it's a good idea for you. But then, what is? What should we do instead? Should we do no interviewing at all? Hire people on the spot? I don't think things are black or white, there's always a spectrum, and the correct approach might be different depending on your company, your team, and your hiring needs. If we want to hire effectively, we need to be realistic about uh, our company and the characteristics of the developer market out there. It's normal for companies to want the more senior developers, they truly are worth their salt. But guess what? They are also more difficult to hire. There's less supply of them and more demand. So you're going to have a hard time snatching them. And you can make it even harder if you make them go through a difficult and long hiring process. The good news is you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. Most companies, what they really need is a small amount of mentors and decision makers, and then a bigger amount of horsepower. 
That's what the mid-level developers shine. People with some experience, which know how to code, and can work with minimal supervision. Then there's juniors. They are cheap, easy to hire, and often young and willing to work long hours to compensate for their inexperience. But no matter how smart they are, they need at least some amount of supervision and guidance, so out of the box you don't get a lot of value from them. But on the long run, they can be a valuable investment if you manage to keep them with you and set them on a progression path. So step one is target the type of developers matching your needs. Step two is test for each segment appropriately. It's okay for a junior straight out of uni to pair on implementing a single algorithm. They often come with no experience at all, and you want to make sure that they at least know the very basics of coding. For seniors, on the other hand, you want to keep testing to the minimum possible in order not to scare them off. If you must, I feel it's okay to discuss about higher level topics regarding architecture or tech stacks, perhaps discussing the one at your company. Some whiteboarding in this context is acceptable. But algorithms, quiz questions, or take-home projects I find are even insulting at this level. They make you look like you don't trust that the candidate is experienced. For those in between, a mix might be in order. Pairing on something from your own code base could be a good two-way exercise in which the candidate also gets a feeling of of what uh, they are going to find in the company. Take on projects when they are sensible, because many times they're not, might also work at, the, at this level, as well as discussing on technologies in an informal way. A very important thing to remember is that hiring goes, goes both ways. You're not just selecting people, people are also selecting you. So the higher you go up the seniority ladder, the more you need to relax the friction and switch from a buying man's mindset to a selling mindset. It can be okay for a junior to have to prove that they are worth your time, but for seniors, it's the other way around. You need to prove to them that your company is worth their time, so don't waste their time. But at every stage, I think it's important to proceed with respect and trust for the applicant and try to keep the process as relaxed and pleasant as possible. Now, let's change topics and talk uh, for a bit about diversity hiring. If normal hiring is difficult, hiring diverse people seems to be downright impossible for most companies. When we say diversity, what I mean is hiring people from demographic groups that, for some reason or another, are underrepresented in our industry. For example, women, but also older people. And in this industry, notice, 40 years is already old age. Uh, non-whites, people with disabilities. Um, when I say underrepresented, I mean that they are present in small quantities uh, in, a pool, in the pool of available developers. Why some of these collectives are minorities in our industry when they account for a much larger share of the general population is out of a scope for this presentation. We will focus here just on how to hire from these already small percentages. So why exactly is it hard to hire these people? First, as we've seen, there's not a lot of them. We have to be realistic. You can't expect your team to have a higher percentage of diverse people than there exist in the hiring pool. Then there is similarity bias. This is an unconscious tendency to connect better with people who are similar to us. It's that feeling of, yeah, this guy gets it. He's totally on my wavelength that you get with some people. And it's very difficult to get that feeling with diverse applicants because they are different from you. And they are different not only in physical appearance, the issue is that they have a different culture and different behavioral traits. For example, imposter syndrome, or in general a lack of confidence, is well documented to be more prevalent in women than in men. And popular hiring practices vastly favor confident people. Diverse candidates will also put a lot of value in having a work-life balance. Many have dependents, need to care for their health, or simply value having time for them outside of coding. So a culture of work hard, play hard doesn't work for them. This is often confused with lack of passion. The culture mismatch hurts in both directions. A healthy company culture is the most important factor that diverse applicants seek on a job. So if they feel there's a culture mismatch, they will turn down your offers or even not apply for your jobs. So, if hiring diverse people is difficult, why should we bother at all with it? Let's be honest. Working with similar people has real advantages too. 
If people think like you, you barely need to communicate with them. They can be more autonomous and working with them feels easier. But there's a drawback. There's only one opinion and one way to do things. If this way has a weakness, you won't be able to realize. It's like your team is a stack of identical Swiss cheese slices, all with the holes perfectly lined up. On the other hand, working with diverse people requires more communication and understanding. They think different from you. They have different opinions and approaches, and it takes effort for both sides to adapt to the ways of the other. But once you manage to do that, you will come out stronger. In a diverse team, people complement each other. The cheese slices have the holes in different places, so you will end up having no gaps in your cheese structure. Okay, let's say I've convinced you and you want to hire diverse developers, but how? The good news for you is that there is a magic formula, but it takes some effort to achieve. First, you will need to attract, to attract them. And for that, you need a company culture that is friendly to diverse people. Bro culture, work hard, play hard is fun, but very off putting for diverse candidates. In order to cast a wider net, you will need to tone it down a bit and make your culture a bit more boring, more neutral, more professional. It doesn't mean not having a culture, just putting the value in work ethics or competency rather than things like hustling or people being fun to have drinks with. It's very important for your culture to encourage a work-like balance while discouraging toxic behaviors such as discrimination, harassment, patronizing, etc. Second, once you're attracting them, you need to learn to recognize their value. Due to similarity bias, their differences are often mistaken for, uh, for incompetence. But remember, these candidates often lack confidence and free time, so it's normal for them to not have any experience outside their jobs or not know a lot of technologies. It's normal to diagnose this as they lack passion or they don't look very experienced when this is not the case. Big bonus, if you adapt your culture and hiring process to be more inclusive, it will become easier to hire non-diverse people too. Regular white guys, despite demographically being the same collective, can be culturally diverse too. People who you would have previously dismissed as not being a culture match perhaps now will pass your filters. <clears throat> okay, final word of advice, don't talk and hire. What I mean is don't hire diverse people at, at any cost just because you want to have the diverse team badge. The badge itself is worth nothing if you can't reap the benefits. Similarity bias is difficult to overcome. It takes a lot of effort and practice to start seeing value in different traits than you're used to. But if you truly don't see it, don't force it either. Just don't hire the person. If you hire someone, but then don't value them, they will notice. It will hurt their self-esteem. They will be unhappy and they will leave your company. Repeat this a couple times and their confidence will hurt so much that they may decide to leave the industry altogether. And before we finish, let's quickly go over some extra tips and tricks. When designing your interview process, try to keep testing to the minimum viable possible. This might mean that you just need to do a face-to-face -face interview, and that's it. When in doubt, less testing is better than more testing. Keep your process short. The whole process with all the steps combined should be no more than two or three hours. Time is valuable both for your candidate and for team members. Beware of asymmetry. The interview inside has all of the context. And, but the candidate doesn't. Uh, prefer open-ended discussions rather than questions with right or wrong answers. Many people try to tailor tests and questions uh, to search for traits and even have a checklist. I think this is self-deceiving. All you can get from an interview uh, is a general feeling. Once you have a process in place, test it on your team first. You might be surprised as many of your best engineers can't pass the process. From time to time, there comes an applicant with a portfolio. Open source contributions, a blog, a podcast, pet projects. When someone comes with this much to show, don't send them homework. You do the homework uh, and go check their stuff. A short contract is a great alternative to testing. No amount of testing is going to be as accurate and as fair as a real job. But for it to work, you need the candidate to not be working elsewhere and have a fast and efficient onboarding process so that the candidate can have a chance to demonstrate product, uh, productivity quickly. About rejections. 
you have a debt with the candidate for then investing your time and energy. Uh, at least have a basic etiquette and tell them that they are out. Don't ghost them. It's great if you can also give them honest feedback. This way they can take some learning for the next interview. People are often terrified of getting a false positive, a bad hire. Don't be. That's what probation periods are for. You will lose more time, more energy and more money seeking for the perfect hire than keeping a bad hire for a short period of time. And remember, the best candidates are probably already working with you. They are your own employees. They have all the context. They build your systems. They already know your process. Make sure you keep them with you and raise their salaries to match those of any new hires. Also, you can evolve them into higher level roles so that you don't need to hire senior developers in the future. Um, that's all. Thank you for attending my talk. I hope it was fun and educational. And we now have a few minutes for questions, but please be invited to also follow up online. Bye bye.